God can do everything for you, but he can't have faith for you. Jesus said, have faith in God. He did many things for people, for his disciples. He healed, he delivered them, he provided, he turned water into wine. And the only thing he couldn't do for them was to have faith on their behalf. And the only, even though, I mean, Christ has finished his work of redemption, he's given us all that we need. We know that from scripture, he has provided all that we need. He has defeated the enemy. The on, and the, the only thing that's left is not to repeat, it's not for us to repeat what he has done and do it all over again as though he has not done it or he has not finished it, but to have faith. The only thing that's left is a fight of faith. Jesus has defeated the enemy. Christ has conquered the enemy. And we are still in the fight, but this fight is the fight of faith, like we said. And, and it's so important to know this because the approach and the mindset that we see a lot of Christians take to the things of the spirit or spiritual warfare is as though it's not a finished work and that we have to finish the work that Christ has already finished. The approach that a lot of believers in Christ take is as though Christ did half of it and we have to do the other half of defeating the enemy. The approach that a lot of Christians take is like maybe it's almost even though if you say these things conceptually, they agree with you, but in the real, in the, from the way that uh, they go about their Christian life, from the way they go about their service to God, the way they do things, it's just like Christ did it halfway and it is our turn to complete the rest of it, which is not true. This is a finished work on the cross of Calvary. Jesus said it himself, it is finished. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Do we really know the meaning of it is finished? The Bible says when he said that, the veil in the temple tore from bottom down. It was ripped. What does the veil signify in spirituals, uh, in, in spiritually? It is the veil between us and God. It was ripped totally. That means that the barrier has been broken. The hurdle has been taken off. The curtain has been drawn, has been pulled apart. Now we have access to God. It was not a coincidence that the moment Jesus said it is finished, that veil in the temple that, that was between the, 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 the outer court and the inner court, and the, the outer court and the inner court were, were on this side, then the Holy of Holies, which is the most holy place, was right inside. Only the priest could go to those places before then. But the moment Jesus said, it is finished, this veil ripped, got ripped from the top to the bottom. Significance of access to every believer, significant of access to Gentiles who were non-Jews, where we have access now to the Father through the finished work of Christ. So what has he not done? What else is there for him to do? This work is accomplished. All that we would ever need all that we would ever require, you know, to live the life that God intends for us is already done. It's already finished. It's the finished work. But we are still in a fight. Why are we in a fight? This fight is not to defeat the enemy, to repeat what Christ has done, as though he has not done it or he has not completed it, or to, to, to make, which, which in turns make the cross of Christ of no effect. This fight is the fight 
of faith in what he has done. So, you are in a battle that has already been won. All that is left is for us to walk, to begin to walk in the reality of it as first hand reality of it. Like you know it, like you were there. Because Jesus says, the Bible says that Christ, that we were crucified with Christ. <laughs> Paul says it over and over again that we were, we, he, he teaches us in, his, in the epistles that we went to the cross with Christ and we were buried with Christ and we were resurrected with Christ and now we are seat, jointly seated with Christ at the right hand of God right now, not futuristic. Now, right now we are jointly seated. Now, that's a position of authority. That's a position of authority. But take it again, take me back again. How do many Christians live? Oh, we live like we are still slaves. You know, we live like we are still uh, uh, defeated. We live like we are still tenants in our father's house. The Bible says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. We live below what I call below redemptive privileges. So the battle has been won and all that is left is a fight of faith. And how does faith come then? Oh, the Bible says, I would be able to uh, give references to the scriptures. Please be feel free to Ask if you need a uh, 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 particular uh, verses of the scriptures that we're quoting today. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's how faith comes. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let me just emphasize again that it's not a fight to repeat what Jesus has done. You're not meant to do it all over again. Your fight is a fight of faith and it's a different kind of fight. <laughs> We're not fighting the same fight Jesus fought. We're fighting a different kind of fight. We are fighting the fight of faith. It's a fight from victory, not just for victory. It's a fight of faith. Not to get God to do something, but to exercise faith in what he has already done. To walk in it like we believe it, like we know it, like we are sure of it. As I'm sure of the color of the jacket, of the shirt I'm wearing, it's gray. How I ask myself lots of times, does, am, I, am I that sure, am I that certain? of the work that Christ has done on my behalf, of the forgiveness of sins, of redemption, of salvation, of, of my healing when I'm sick in my body, of all the things that came with the redemptive work of Christ. Because not being that sure, not being that certain is what is called doubt and that is what depletes faith that is what takes away from our faith doubt d o u b t do you believe totally it's 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 what takes away from our faith so jesus says all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And he then says, behold, I give you power to overcome saints and scorpions and all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. Nothing shall harm you. So 
So, how does faith come? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We can break that down, unpack that in many ways, but I don't want to go there. Let's just keep it and uh, uh, as a as a premise for what we'll be discussing uh, in the next few minutes. The fight of faith, listen to this, is just is really the fight to make the word of God more real to you. That's what it is about. The word is God with us. The word is as real as Jesus is. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. So, and the word was God. So, God and his word are inseparable. <laughs> so, to have the word of God with you is to have God with you. So, if somebody says that um, the U.S. Is now, has now merged with um, Canada, and U.S. and Canada are now one country, and I, I, if I tell you that U.S. and do you know U.S. and Canada have become one? It's just been a uh, it's, as, it's now um, official. You're going to ask me who, how did I know that? And then I can easily tell you, oh yeah, yeah, that's what Chica said. Chica has declared that the world, Canada and US are now one. <laughs> and the next question you're going to ask is, who is Chica to say that? because she does not have the authority to make that pronouncement. But if that's coming from Joe Biden's wife or from the head of the Senate or something, you take it more seriously. Oh, wow, that's serious. That's the authenticity of that is verified by where it came from because the person has the authority to make that kind of announcement because of the authority there is with authority comes credibility so if you can take somebody's word and run with it be if they have the authority to give you that word that you don't need to go verify, you just run with it. There are certain people that can say certain things about this country that you can act on because they are in authority and they are, they have the credibility to say it. Somebody moved his family to the US recently and was telling me the testimony, he's been here for a while and he moved his family and they are denied them visa but he joined a church to serve in a Baptist church where a congressman who is in charge of a lot of uh, international affairs was a member. And the person sent a letter to the embassy to say he is serving with us as a volunteer. Could you please uh, attend to him? And within a couple of days, everything was sorted out. That is credibility that comes with authority. So, if God says something, the only reason that it wouldn't be true is if he doesn't have the authority and he doesn't have the credibility. Or I don't believe he has the authority or he has the credibility, which could be two different things. And my, that part where I don't believe is actually where the problem is because he has the authority and the credibility I'm the one who does not believe that he has the authority and the credibility. So I don't treat it like it is true. And that's what faith is all about. Taking the word of God as the truth. So the fight to come to the point where God becomes more real to you through his word 
is what faith is about. When you come to that point, the devil can try everything, but he won't be able to stop you. He won't. The weapons of our warfare, the Bible says, are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. They are powerful. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. <laughs> and the primary weapon you really have as a believer is the word of God. God offers everything through his word. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was we was with God and what was God? The word was God. And this word became flesh and came down and dwelt amongst us. Now that's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the word of God in person. Jesus is the word of God personified. Because if you check John 1, 1, first it says in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then going other verses, he starts to use the word he, he, not it, but he, 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 he. That is Jesus. Became flesh, dwells amongst us. That is Christ. So, The word of God is God with us. Now, there's two things Christ, God has left with us after, after the physical manifestation of Christ. The only two things we have is the spirit and the word. And that's what the Bible calls two immutable things that by scriptures cannot be broken. By these two immutable things, the spirit of God and the word of God. That's how we relate with God right now, by his spirit and by his word. We have not seen the father physically. We only have his spirit dwelling in us, and we have his word, which is alive, that dwells in us and with us. So how does faith come again? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. The word of God then is the tool that generates faith. Faith coming by the word. You can't have faith except you spend time in the word. You have to prioritize the word of God in your daily life, in all your affairs. John 1, 1 again says, Jesus is the word. Teaches us that Jesus is the word and that the word became flesh and dwells among us. That means that you can actually treat the word as a person of Jesus by the leading of the Holy Spirit. You must take the word as the real, the word of God. Now, this is it. The word of God must become as real as Christ talking and living physically with you. When this is caught as a revelation, it changes your whole life, it changes everything. And revelation really can't be taught, it can only be caught. Sometimes you've been hearing something forever, but then it just gets illuminated in your spirit one day. Whoa, like, bro, that's revelation. The word of God is just as real, uh, praise God, to us as the person of Jesus. When Jesus left, he said, I would leave you a comforter, the Holy Spirit. And he said, it's even more expedient that I go because the one who is coming, it will be your comforter, your guide. He will lead, guide you into all truth which is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit helps us to relate with God and helps us, he helps to break the word of God to us like bread. So when we have a relationship with God and with the Holy Spirit, he, he inspires us and gives us revelation in the word. And then faith coming by the word. So 
the word of God is just as potent, as powerful as though Jesus himself was with us. It's like having the word of God is just as potent, as powerful as though Christ Jesus himself wakes up with us every morning. So the fight of faith is really the fight to make the word of God more real to you. The fight to redefine your realities through the word of God. The fight to come to the point where God becomes more real to you through his word. When you come to that point, the devil can try everything, but he won't be able to stop you, like we said before. So the word of God is like, it's, it's, it's faith food. The word of God is like faith vitamin. The word of God is like faith vitamin supplements. Because it is what faith, faith feeds on. The relationship between faith and the word of God is so like symbiotic. They are like two, -sided, two sides of a coin. The word of God produces faith. Faith on the other hand, make, on the other hand makes the word to take effect. The Bible talks about the word that was preached to some. He profited some who heard it because they mixed it with faith. Some people heard it, but they didn't mix it with faith, so it profited them not. But to those who heard it and mixed it with faith, it profits them. So two people can hear the same word, can receive the same message, can receive the same word from God, and it profits one person, and it does not profit the other person because they did not mix it with faith. It's interesting because the word needs faith or needs to be mixed with faith to be effective on the one hand. And on the other hand, it is the word of God that generates faith. So all you really need is faith to make the word of God take effect. And you really need the word of God to generate faith. Without that, the word won't take full effect. And we're going to keep wondering why the word seems to work for some people and it doesn't work for others. And ask why it seems like every time uh, the word doesn't work for me, but it works for so that. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And they that come to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him without faith, this is impossible to please God. And though that they that come to God must know that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. The word of the word of God is real, the word of God is true. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, the Bible says it does not return to him void, except it it, it profits in that which it was spoken. So it's not the word of God or God that something is wrong with. It is us. We are the ones who are not walking many times or most times in faith, or we are not, we are not, we don't have faith in the word. So hence, sometimes, most times we don't experience the benefits of the world. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. They that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And then 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strong goals, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. There are many high things that tend to exalt themselves against higher than the knowledge of God. There are many things that tend to suppress, that wants to relegate, that wants to, to set aside the word of God, the authority in the word of God in our lives. And those are the things that we contend against. So it then says, bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And one important thing is, as we begin to bring this home close, is to, we must recognize and understand the battle that we are in. Um, we are all fighting spiritual battles, but 
it differs from one person to the other. I believe that the, the what happened with the fall of man and all the sin that came into the world and all of the imperfections that came with it manifests in different people in different ways. You know, for some people, um, it is greed and selfishness. For some other people, it is um, jealousy and envy. For some other people, they have more anger and, and animosity and bitterness more than some other people naturally. It's just like it's bear, it bears different kinds of fruit in different people's lives. But at the same time, it all boils down to one thing. It's the imperfection of man that came as a result of the fall. So we must recognize the battle that we're in. And we cannot, if, if we don't know the battle we're in, and we, we spoke extensively about that last week, we'll be fighting the wrong battle or we will be fighting, the, we were fighting on the wrong layer. What the enemy does, he puts several layers on top of our fight of, of, of faith so that we're not really dealing with the root cause. We are dealing with the fourth, third layer or fourth layer you know, above it. And the, the real issue may just be a matter of self-image, you know, but it, we may be fighting with people all the time. You know, we're fighting with people. This person is a problem. That person is a problem. This, uh, and the real fight may just be something that's within, that if we will deal with that, we will not need to fight some of those other battles. You know, and if we don't recognize that, we'll be fighting the wrong fight. We'll be fighting the wrong people. We'll be, we will be putting our energy in the wrong places. Ephesians 6, 13 to 18 says, wherefore, how do we fight this battle? Just to bring this to a close, uh, to put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor. Um, wherefore, take unto you, you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the, in the evil day, having done all to stand, stand, therefore having your loins girded with the truth, having the blessed breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the uh, gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, now watch this. Wherewith you shall able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication, that's verse 18, and in spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. Now notice something in all of these things. He didn't mention, and I know we know all of this, but he, there was no armor mentioned for your back. So, if you are running away or avoiding the enemy, you remain vulnerable to the enemy. So, sometimes avoidance is only a postponement towards a bigger battle in front. You've got to know that the only way to fight the battle is to face the enemy. The only way to fight this battle is to confront the enemy. The only way to fight this battle is to take on the battle head on. Because there's no, there's no armor for the back. There's shield of faith. There is the breastplate of righteousness. There is the your loins guarded with, fresh, uh, with the truth, and all of the the sword of the spirit. All of this is not for the back. So when we turn our back and run or avoid the fight, then we are defenseless. We are vulnerable towards the enemy. The only way to maintain our victory, the Bible says the gate, the, 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 the church, Christ, church of Christ is marching on and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. The gates of hell, that means that it's not, it, it doesn't say that our gates will not be, uh, 
broken down by the enemy. He says the gate of the enemy cannot resist us. That's an offensive, not a defensive approach. So we must, we have to be on the offense all of the time. We can't wait for the enemy to do this, then we respond, and then he does the next thing. Then that's giving the initiative to the enemy. Taking back all that God has for us, that has given to us, that all the enemy has told him means that we have to take the war, the fight of faith, and be proactive. We have to go ahead in our fight of faith and begin to take all back the enemy, all that God has given to us that the enemy has stolen from us. Why? Because that is the only way to live the life that God has given us in Christ. When he says, fight the good fight of faith, and then do what? Take hold. Take hold of this life that Christ has given us. So to conclude, the fight of faith is only, the only fight that's left for us to fight is a fight of faith. And just like we said before, Christ has already given us the victory. We have overcome. But the only fight that's left is the fight of faith. And the fight of faith is all about the, the goal of this fight is to make what Christ has done for us become more real to us. So we can act on it. I do hope that this has been a blessing to us today, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Dr. Alfred, you got to go second today. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> um, we thank God. I really, really. So, you know, they say, you know, you can only impress. I don't like. Obviously, it's used differently, but you really impressed God by 